Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. I'm Mike Russell. Today on Farm Week, he's a Connecticut farmer with Yankee Doodle support for his Caribbean cuisine. And Southern Gardening, you know what I mean, Fern? And <laughs> Gary Bachman sure does. Plus, one more ride in the friendly skies. It's not Top Gun, but hang on. And a hot story from Hatch, New Mexico, the chili pepper capital of the world. Farm Week starts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Russell. And I'm Zach Ashmore. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. As the nation continues to talk about opening up, we hope that you're healthy and safe. There are just over two million farms in America. Those who've chosen ag as a way of life know that even in normal times, it's difficult to get started. But there's at least one group acting as a matchmaker between landowners wanting to get out and the next wave hoping to get in. Here's Peter Tubbs. Maurice Ramsey harvests amaranth on a farm he rents near Brooklyn, Connecticut. A native of Jamaica, Maurice grows the plant for the Caribbean population living in the region, which is unable to find much of the produce it needs for Caribbean cooking. Uh, I just didn't have enough variety for uh, as far as the, the stuff I'm used to back home. And the stuff that I could get, I wasn't pleased with the quality. So I decided I was going to grow my own. Ramsey has spent a career in the food industry and currently manages a fast food chain restaurant. The opportunity to fill a produce niche began a search for a farm, but finding ground to rent was the biggest hurdle to his start in agriculture. To work this farm requires a 45 minute commute each way. Land is a lot more expensive in Connecticut. That was working and I thought I wouldn't be able to farm, but something just told me not to give up. I kept uh, trying. Uh, and then I was searching for land online all the time. I found this website called FarmLink. FarmLink is an online tool from Connecticut Farmland Trust, which matched Ramsey to a farm with high tunnels for rent. FarmLink assists farmers who are looking for land and matches their agricultural interest with landowners. Over 70% of seekers who rent through FarmLink are considered beginning farmers. When I saw a greenhouse, I got a little bit excited because uh, I am trying, I'm growing tropical plants, you know. So I gave her a call and she told me to come up and take a look at the farm. I came up and I took a look at the farm. I thought she was an awesome lady. She was really kind. The rest is history. I told her that I wanted it and she said, let's go for it. Sandy Broder and her husband had built the tunnels to raise vegetables, but were ready to step back from that side of their operation. A lot of farmers around here are getting too old to continue farming. So do you sell your house and your, your farm to a development or something, or do you want to keep it in a farm? And if you do, how can you do that? Well, Farm Trust is a great help because we've got 125 acres here, and when we're not doing hay anymore, we want to be able to keep it as a farm. USDA data shows that less than 10% of the state of Connecticut is farmland, and only half of that measure gets harvested every year. The 122,000 acres in production are a scarce resource in the state. Plots of 10 to 40 acres, the size of a typical operation in the state, can be hard to match with renters looking for ground. Connecticut FarmLink helps make the match between landowners and new farmers by bridging the needs of the potential renter with the wishes of the landowner. This is the first time in our nation's history that the majority of landowners are more than two generations from a farm. So they don't know what they don't know. So, and in some cases, they don't even have the, the vocabulary to have a discussion with a farm seeker. So in some cases, we can act as that translator. The organization also assists landowners in creating a trust so they can pass ownership on to future generations. After two decades of pairing landowners and farmers, Experience has taught CFT officials how to ensure the legal instructions for the property are kept open to the largest number of potential uses. Lily Orr manages the FarmLink program, as well as the group's easement and trust programs. 
a lot of it is about, you know, if you're a seeker, it's what your desires and what your needs and what your goals are for your farm. Whereas if you're a farmland owner, it's explaining your farm operation um, or the potential or the history of agriculture on your land. So a lot of people don't know how to put that stuff into words. So their ability to really even assess a piece of property to know its suitability for different kinds of agriculture, let alone try to figure out whether a farm seeker has the knowledge and has the right kind of business that's going to be a good match with their property. Connecticut also has the highest percentage of beginning farmers over the age of 45. Maurice Ramsey falls into that category, and the two acres of land he can afford have him farming only part-time. The niche quality of Caribbean crops has resulted in growing demand for produce like amaranth and scotch peppers. Ramsey serves grocery stores and restaurants in both Connecticut and New York City. Right now, my customers are the Caribbean community, I would say, for the most part. But uh, it is growing. It is uh, becoming a little bit more mainstream as people are trying to eat healthier. They're looking for other options. And um, the cuisine is also, itself is also catching on. As his second season on the Broder farm winds down, Ramsey sees full-time farming on the horizon. The Broders are happy to have the high tunnels being used and a new generation working in agriculture. I didn't want those things sitting out there idle, and, and this way I'm, I'm able to give something back to somebody else too. So it's, it's a good thing. And after a while you start liking the smell of the dirt, you start missing it. It's so weird. I mean, you know, <laughs> how, do you explain to, how do you say that to the average person? Sometimes I miss the smell of dirt, you know. In Southern Gardening, as you cope with what's left of the lockdown, are you looking for distractions with a beautiful but easy care plant for your front porch? Extension horticulturalist Garrett, Dr. Gary Bachman has those five little, little words for you. Know what I mean, Fern? Here's Gary. popular but old-time plant is Boston fern and it's no wonder with the lush and lacy bright green foliage but did you know that there's other types of ferns let's take a look at some fern baskets will thrive in our Mississippi landscapes as long as they are kept in partial to full shade oddly enough asparagus fern is not actually a fern and is really a member of the lily family Lush stems of dense, linear, needle-like foliage cascade down from this hanging basket. This is a fast-growing, easy-care basket plant. Sword fern is commonly called Kimberly Queen fern and is gorgeous with both upright and sprawling growth habits. This fern has lush, sword-shaped fronds. The leathery and toothed dark green foliage provides great texture. This is a great choice for our hot and humid summers. Living up to its name, macho fern is a tough, rumble and tumble fern. The long, arching branches feature wide, dark green fronds that have a much coarser texture than many other ferns. And finally, the popular Boston fern is perhaps the most common fern for hanging baskets. The graceful and arching branches are lush with a rich green color. Growing up to three feet by three feet, this plant makes a statement hanging on the porch. These ferns love consistent root zone moisture. A watering can with a long spout is an easy way to water them. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Plant them and they will grow. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, a hot story. We're at the Rio Grande River, where in that part of the country they grow a crop that's been on plates longer than apple pie has been American. Hatch, New Mexico is the chili pepper capital of the world. There's even a chili pepper institute for an industry worth almost half a billion dollars a year. There's more to the story, though. Find out what it is coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, 
and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea, extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Okay, ready for a good ride? Aerial applicators, also known as crop dusters, are still flying just about everywhere in America. One Aviation Association says there are more than 1,400 pilots in the U.S. dusting millions of acres of crops while avoiding power lines and water towers and the ground. Here's Josh Bittner with the story. Flying is the ultimate freedom. You leave the ground and all your problems, all your worries, they're behind you. Like it's you and it's the airplane. Agricultural aviator Jordan Omstead is entering his fifth year of flying the friendly skies over his home state of Iowa. After graduating the Air Force Academy in 2006, Omstead spent time in Afghanistan and Iraq in the military and as a private contractor before coming home to pursue a childhood passion. I like to tell people I had to get out of the Air Force to start my flying career. My dad was a pilot. I grew up on a farm, so this is the combination of agriculture and aviation. So I get to be a part of all the attributes that I really love. So. USDA figures reveal the Hawkeye State, a national leader in corn and soybean production, planted over 23 million acres of both crops combined in 2017 at a value of $13.6 billion. But even robust yields are susceptible to pest, disease, and fertility pressures, which, if left unchecked, can negatively impact farm revenues. That's where pilots like Omstead soar into the picture. The vast majority of what we do is insecticide and fungicide. Aerial application, or crop dusting, began nearly a century ago in the U.S and over time has reaped the benefits of technological advancement like other wings of agriculture. Several types of growers and ranchers can employ the method, along with herbicides, dry fertilizers, and cover crop seeding. According to the National Agricultural Aviation Association, a Washington, D.C.-based industry advocate, nationally, 71 million acres of cropland are treated from above every year in addition to millions of acres of pasture and rangeland. In Iowa, that amounts to a more than $214 million annual industry, with the mix applied to around 5 million acres, as estimated by the Iowa Agricultural Aviation Association. We actually put it on better than a ground rig, because a ground rig, they'll go out there in winds that we won't work in. Cliff Crowell owns Stardust Ag Aviation. He taught Omstead the trade before hiring him as a subcontractor and will one day pass the business down to him. Crowell, a Navy veteran, launched his career in crop dusting over 20 years ago, landing in Iowa 
by chance. When I got out of the military, I had a buddy that lived here. So I flipped a coin and told him uh, Des Moines, Iowa, with Little Rock. We went uh, heads, so I wound up in Des Moines. <laughs> Though ground applicators might have a different take on best methods, Crowell says diligence is paramount to ironing out any shortcomings. We had, do have some drift problems, but we're dealing with those and working with those constantly as far as the safety aspect of it. But uh, no, I think the, uh, the airplane does a better job and is a safer way of applying it. Critics charge all manner of spray applications are susceptible to contamination and runoff, which can threaten the environment and human health. But aerial proponents point out all of their liquid pesticides are approved by the Environmental Protection Agency and say they employ precision techniques. Without getting into a lot of aerodynamics, just the forces coming off this wing are pushing the, the air behind the airplane down into the crops. And the way we've got the booms positioned, they're releasing chemical into that air. So it forces it down with it. That said, the closer we are to the crops, the less fall time there is for that chemical to evaporate. So we get just as close as we can safely. Omstead references the myriad safety precautions emphasized by the industry and his mentor, like pre-flight analysis, annual inspections, and scouting fields for people, obstacles, and other hazards. Safety is always an issue, just like ground-based applications or that type of thing. We want to make sure that we're doing it correctly and well. Recently retired Iowa State Extension Agricultural Engineer Mark Hanna emphasizes the land-grant university's outreach efforts to local flight crews, while national training to calibrate equipment also takes place ahead of flight season. We spend a, a fair bit of time every year working with aerial applicators, doing a good patternation check off their aircraft, uh, making sure that we've got a, a, a good uniform application, make sure that we don't have uh, some of the things that, that might cause some, some off-target movement or drift on that aircraft. Over the past several years, Stardust Ag Aviation has seen a steady rise in customers seeking aerial cover crop seeding. Released at a higher altitude than spray liquids, the boom accounted for over 10% of the company's business in 2017. That's good news for Iowa, which is highly susceptible to runoff. Cover crop has some distinct uh, advantages, particularly for water quality. Uh, it ke helps keep soil in place, but another thing it does is it uses nutrients uh, down in the soil, and particularly nitrates. Some see growth areas for conservation and precision agriculture as food production increases to serve a growing global population. Going forward, Hannah says it's possible the industry could benefit from unmanned systems working in tandem with pilots. But for Amstead, it's easy enough now to use an iPhone to map routes to his customers' fields and listen to his favorite playlists all day long. Sometimes there's some classic rock in there, sometimes there's some Beethoven, just a little bit of everything. Well, here's that hot story we promised you. Hatch, New Mexico, along Highway 26 in the southern part of the state, claims to be the chili pepper capital of the world. You're about to find out how it pretty much lives up to its name. But there's a lot of backstory to all that success. Once again, here's Josh Bittner. In the land of enchantment, New Mexico's signature farm commodity casts a spell on the taste buds, sparking a fiery debate. So, the big question, red or green? Green. Red. <laughs> Chili peppers, green or red, have enriched the southwestern palate for longer than apple pie has been American. We let it tumble in there and the skin just comes right off. Green chilies make everything better. Oh yeah, we well, eat them on everything. Every year, tourists flock to the small town of Hatch, New Mexico, the self-proclaimed green chili capital of the world to celebrate and devour a fresh harvest. I just love this place. I'll probably be back next year 
to buy more chili so I can have it all year long. More lucrative green, New Mexico chilies turn red the longer they stay on the vine, offering a different taste profile and dried powder. The crop is entwined with local identity. Hanging ristras are symbols of health and good luck. And New Mexico has enjoyed good fortune as the national leader in chili pepper production, though fault lines may be appearing. If you look at the production in the United States in 2016, California accounted for about two-thirds of that production, and New Mexico accounted for slightly under a third. Dr. Jay Lillywhite is an agricultural economist with New Mexico State University, where hybrid research done over a century ago gave birth to today's robust strains. And on campus in Las Cruces, the Chili Pepper Institute continues to educate and promote an industry he claims is worth over $400 million annually. Lily White adds that although New Mexican chili production has dropped from 35,000 acres in the early 1990s down to around 8,000 today, the state's processing infrastructure still beats out domestic competition. But pressure from other states and Mexico have some digging deeper as a buffer against disruption. There's only so much chili that can be grown in the Hatch region or only so much chili that can be grown in New Mexico. And as that demand continues to increase, if you can actually build a marketing campaign around that, there will obviously be premiums. Hatch Valley growers have adopted a distinct branding strategy to distinguish their product from a host of others. Adjacent to the Rio Grande, the region has long been hailed for its unique blend of favorable soil and climate conditions. The Hatch Valley here in southern New Mexico has become synonymous with uh, high quality green chili. Grower Preston Mitchell says his yields average 20 to 30 tons per acre, with prices ranging from $500 to over $600 per ton for green varieties. You can hear that nice crisp pop as it pops open tear that pot open and you'll see just a thin little yellow strip running up that vein and that's the capsaicin in the pod that you taste as heat. Labor costs can bite into profits because harvest is done by hand. Mitchell says finding workers is a challenge in itself. Mechanization, long rumored, remains elusive. And drought, all too abundant. 95% of the water that fills up Elephant Butte comes from snowpack runoff. And we just haven't had it in, in, since 2003 on a regular basis. We may have one good year, maybe two, and then it, nothing. Elephant Butte Irrigation District covers over 90,000 acres of irrigable land in southern New Mexico. Manager Gary Esslinger says low levels in reservoirs on the Rio Grande north of Hatch forced ratepayer allotments down from an average three acre feet to just 10 inches in 2018. But a complicated set of decades old agreements also legally require the utility to satisfy surface water deliveries downstream first to Texas and Mexico. Certainly we have to abide by the law and yet try our best to supply the water that's necessary to these farms. It's a constant battle. Uh, and the litigation is always flowing here. It, it never stops. EBID has been at the center of legal wrangling between the federal government, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas for over a decade in regards to water rights under the Rio Grande Compact Agreement. The case is expected to go before the U.S. Supreme Court next year. And it's a gamble for New Mexico, says Esslinger, adding that new stakeholders, ushered in by recent population booms, are unfamiliar and unwilling to compromise with water laws drawn up over 80 years ago. It's the public at large that really doesn't understand the complexity of how we have to operate down here. It's real easy for me to explain to a farmer what's going on because of the drought, because most of these farmers have been here three and four generations, some of them even five. My great-great-grandfather is actually credited with being the first chili farmer in the Hatch Valley. His name was Giuseppe Franzo, and he was an immigrant from Austria. Preston Mitchell's operation pumped a majority of groundwater to irrigate crops during the past season. But over time, only salty, brackish water is left in uncharged aquifers, making an infusion of fresh Rio Grande River water essential. The drought is a major concern to growers in this area. Mitchell has had to grow his business to remain profitable. 
Expanding acres, processing, and roasting chilies have all become a part of the mix. As word spreads and orders for Hatch Valley green chilies come in from across the globe, Mitchell reiterates regional branding is a vital ingredient for future growth. Hatch chili is sought for by buyers at grocery stores such that they will not take chili from elsewhere. So it, it kind of allows us to have this little niche within the overall green chili market and uh, continue to farm and continue to be able to farm profitably. Gotta love those peppers. Well, next week, a story about wide open rural spaces. A lot of people get lost every year. Finding them can be a miracle, but there's actually a far better system and it's literally been on the grid for over a decade. But though it can trace a location down to a few meters, you'd be surprised to learn that only about 2% of rescue agencies are using it. Going old school on the grid with geolocation. That's next time on Farm Week. And before we go, in honor of our closing feature today, and thanks to my sister Sherry Wade, who made this for me, a mask with chili peppers on it. It's actually part of an effort she's involved with. You can read about it on Facebook, the Million Mask Challenge, a sew-a-thon to support our healthcare workers and those in need. So far, they've made more than 110,000 masks. Great job, everybody. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.